The senses is the way that we perceive the world. It's how our nervous system detects changes in the environment. I do want to emphasize this whole idea about changes because we can't actually detect things that don't change very well. For example, if the temperature stays the same, you usually don't notice that. It's only when it gets hotter or colder that you notice it. You can do a fun little test if you, you may have done this even in elementary school. Take three bowls of water. Make one bowl of water filled with ice. All right, ice water. Right in front of you, have a bowl of regular tap water, just room temperature water. The last bowl, have it filled with very warm water. If you put your hand into the warm water, your left hand, it'll say, oh, hot, because it's detecting a change in temperature. If you put your right hand into the ice water, you'll go, ah, oh, cold. So your right hand will be reporting cold. Your left hand will be reporting hot. Then take both hands and put them in the same temperature water. The one that had been in hot will say, ah, cool. The one that had been in cold will say, ah, hot. That's because you're detecting changes, not just I'm reporting a temperature of approximately 23 degrees Celsius. All right. Now, there's these specialized cells called sense receptors, and they are categorized in many different ways, but the most basic way to categorize them is how they function, what kind of stimulus do they detect. There's a big group called mechanoreceptors, and those are the ones that detect mechanical or physical changes. These are involved a lot in touch, but they are involved in some things that you don't even think about, like hearing. Right? That's caused by changes in the little hair cells inside of your inner ears, a thing called the cochlea. Thermoreceptors, you might be able to guess, are involved in detecting temperature changes. Chemoreceptors, you might be able to guess on that one, hopefully. Chemo means chemicals. All right? Those are involved in things like taste and smell. Photoreceptors, the root word photo means light. So those detect light. Those are involved in your eyes, for example. Nociceptors is a kind of detector or sensory receptor that people rarely think about, but they're very important. Those are the ones that are involved in detecting damage, i.e. pain. And these are one of the few receptors that we don't have the ability to easily ignore. With uh, chemoreceptors, if you smell your own BO, pretty soon your brain stops being able to pay attention to that. And that's why you rarely can smell yourself or even your own eh, bad breath. But pain receptors, take a needle, stick it in your arm. You'll know it's there. Two minutes later, you'll know it's there. You'll still know it's there. Why don't we adapt very well to nociceptors signals? That's because it means you're being damaged. BO, it's not, it goes away, I don't really need to pay attention to it. Pain, I need to know it's there, I need to stop doing that damage. Pull the pin out, fool. Oh, that's why you don't adapt very well to pain. Now, some of the special senses include balance, which scientists will sometimes call equilibrium. And the major organ of balance is something called the inner ear, which has two kinds of structures involved in dynamic equilibrium, which uses something called the semicircular canals. Those detect rotation of your head versus static equilibrium, which detects changes in your static balance, i.e. suddenly accelerating forwards or backwards or going up or down. If we take a quick look at this diagram over here, you can see this is the inner ear. It's embedded within your skull. If you take your finger and put it in your ear and then shove really hard and crunch through some bones, you'll finally hit the inner ear, although your nociceptors will hopefully stop you from doing that. Here you can see the semicircular canals, and they're, as they name implies, kind of circular. They're filled with a fluid, and at the base of each ring, you'll have a little cup which has a flap, and they're filled with liquid, and if you suddenly rotate your head like this, the semicircular canal that's oriented like that will suddenly shift, and the fluid will stay still, pushing on the flap. The mechanoreceptor there will pick up the signal and send off to the brain, warning, I'm rotating in this axis. There's another one that's set up to rotate or detect rotation like this, and another one set up to detect rotation like that. Now, unless you're very, very good at doing your gymnastics, you'll very rarely go exactly like this or exactly like this. Instead, you'll be doing some combination. And so all of these will be reporting to your brain. The, and your brain will assemble that information to give you a good idea of what the heck is your body doing. If you ever want to mess with this, a good fun illusion of this, you may have done this um, in some kind of obstacle uh, race or uh, course. 
take a baseball bat, put it on the ground, put your head on the baseball bat so that your head is about maybe a yard above the ground, and then go around the baseball bat as fast as you can, five times fast. Then, as soon as you've run five times fast around the baseball bat, stand up and run. And you'll discover that the world seems to be falling over. Why? Because you got one of those semicircular canals. You finally got the fluid moving with you. And so when you stand up, all of a sudden, it continues moving, but that flap gets pushed and your brain says, whoa, the world's falling. It's really entertaining when it happens to other people. Over here, you have the utricle and saccule, which are much like the semicircular canals. They're filled with something and that pushes on uh, mechanoreceptors. Only here, it's typically a gel-like membrane. And when you suddenly accelerate forwards, it pushes those hairs one way or when you accelerate backwards. And same thing with the saccule, which detects up-down kind of acceleration. All right, let's go back over here. Hearing also uses the ear. Now, the ear is actually composed of the outer ear, which helps funnel in the sound, the middle ear, which takes the vibrations of your eardrum and transfers that into vibrations of three bones, the hammer, uh, anvil, and staple, or uh, uh, stirrup, otherwise known as the malus, incus, and stapes bones. And those bones help amplify those vibrations to cause vibration in, yet again, a fluid in the inner ear. In the inner ear, there's this coiled up tube, which is lined with bazillions of those mechanoreceptor hair cells. And the vibrations caused by that uh, middle ear bones causes vibrations somewhere along this long tube. And those hair cells will detect it. That's why if you listen to your iPod for too long, you're causing certain hair cells to be vibrating a lot. And eventually, you can cause damage to those. And once you've got that damage, it's really hard to repair and it may cause permanent hearing loss. Something to be thinking about. All right. Now, the eye does vision. You hopefully know that one. There's two big things going on during vision. First, there's the focusing of the light. Then there's the actual detection of the light. The focusing is done by the cornea, the clear outer part here. That's a fixed focus curved lens. Then you have inside of your eye, you have the adjustable lens. And that can adjust so that you're looking far away or close up. But like I said, that cornea is what does the first part of focusing. And if you've ever heard of somebody getting laser surgery on their eye, what the doctor is doing is they're actually reshaping that cornea to adjust that person's permanent focus. The retina is in the back of the eye. And if we take a look at that, we can see here, here's the front of the eye. Light comes in through the curved cornea, goes through the lens, which can adjust its shape based on whether you're looking at something far away or close up. And then this dark region here is the inner portion of the eye. On the back, you can see this faint yellow thin layer. That's the retina. That's where all the photoreceptors are. You've got over 100 million photoreceptors there, specialized cells that are detecting light. Some of them detect color, some of them detect uh, specific colors, some of them just are looking for motion and light and dark stuff. But all of that data is collected and run through the back of your eye forming the optic nerve. Now you'll also see these red lines going through. Those are the arteries that feed the retina. The re retinal arteries and the little purple guys are the retinal veins. They actually sit on top of the retina, which is weird when you think about it. Why don't I see it? Well, remember, you detect changes. Do those retinal arteries change their position? No. So you hardly, if ever, see them. Now, the only times that you may notice those retinal arteries is if you're really bored, get a small flashlight. Put it right below your eye. Not touching your eye, that hurts. And those nociceptors in your cornea will tell you, stop touching your eye. And just move that back and forth really fast. What that does is having a close light source, moving back and forth really fast, makes the shadows of the retinal arteries start shifting a little bit. <gasps> Suddenly, there's a change, and you'll start to see these weird shadowy cracks in your vision. It's kind of creepy to do. Also, if uh, you've ever seen those sparkling lights when you almost passed out or you stood up suddenly and you're feeling lightheaded, those sparkling lights often are due to sudden drops in the blood pressure. And then as the blood pressure returns, the retinal arteries start feeding the photoreceptors and they go, I'm back. And you report the I'm back signals from your photoreceptors as oh, light. All right. The last thing we're going to talk about is smell and taste. Now, I grouped those together. That's because they both basically are uh, detecting the same thing, chemicals that are entering into your pharynx, the space here that, in, within your nose, and the oropharynx is the, your mouth. 
Now, in the top of your nasal cavity, you have something called the olfactory bulb, which has gazillions, well, not gazillions, but several, several thousand chemoreceptors, each able to detect different kinds of chemicals. Now, they're embedded within mucus, which helps dissolve the chemicals and bring them to the membrane receptors of the olfactory bulb. Your tongue is also covered with chemoreceptors clustered together in these things called taste buds. Here's the top of your tongue, here's the bottom of your tongue. And so, again, dissolving the chemicals in your saliva helps bring them to these receptors, which then detect and send off to your brain. Now, your taste buds are all, not all that good at detecting taste. There's only five basic tastes, uh, sour, sweet, bitter, salty, and then there's this other one called umani otherwise known as savory. And uh, if you're ever curious what it tastes like, get some MSG, monosodium glutamate. That's what they're detecting. So why do we taste lots of different things when we eat? Well, that's because when you're chewing, some of that odor, some of the chemicals coming off of your food goes through the back of your mouth into your nasal cavity, sending signals to your olfactory bulb. And that's how you're able to tell the difference between the sweetness of, say, uh, chocolate, milk chocolate, and the sweetness of, say, dark chocolate, because there's tiny variations in the smells. Now, you might be able to say one's a little bit bitter or a little bit more sour than the others, but the main function or the main uh, component of sm taste is actually smell. And again, I said they have to be dissolved. If your tongue is dry, you can't tell what a taste is. You can try this out. If you take your tongue, just stick it out, eh, and let it dry then put something on it like um, powdered up vitamin C tablets. That's really entertaining. I've done this to some of my students without them realizing. They see what looks like powdered sugar. They put it on their tongue and their tongue can't detect the taste because their tongue is dry. But then they let the saliva start to soak in and all of a sudden they start going ah and scraping stuff off their tongue. You can also try this with sugar if you want to be a little bit nicer to yourself. All right. One last little trick that you can do with this to just demonstrate how interconnected these two things are. Take somebody and offer them, while they're blindfolded, a piece of apple while, they hold, while you hold a onion slice underneath their nose. If they bite into this apple slice, they'll think it's the onion because it's got the right texture, but the smell that's going in their nose will report onion. And that's the senses.